Hello everyone. On behalf of Indian National Trust for Art and Cultural Heritage, INTAC, and the INTAC Conservation Institutes, I extend a very warm welcome to our distinguished speaker, Dr. Anjali Karolia, and everyone who has joined us for today's talk in the Conservation Insights 2020 lecture series. I'm Dr. Padma Rohila, Director ICI Day. Now to introduce our speaker, Dr. Anjali Karolia is Dean, Faculty of Family and Community Sciences, at the Maharaja Sayaji Rao University of Baroda, Vadodara. She was also the former head department of clothing and textiles from 2009 to 17, and a founder member in setting up the Institute of Fashion Technology at the Maharaja Sayaji Rao University of Baroda. She has over 30 year, 38 years of research and teaching experience, and has received a total of eight fellowships and awards during her illustrious career. She has been the recipient of Fulbright Nehru Visiting Lecture Fellowship and was affiliated to Department of Textiles, Apparel and Design, University of Nebraska, Lincoln, and was a primary instructor for the graduate course, Indian Textiles as Costumes and Costumes, Perspectives and Potential. She has to her credit a number of, a large number of research projects. Some completed our project on documentation of the handcrafted textiles of Gujarat with the Heritage Trust funded by the Ministry of Textiles and a UGC major research project on minor fibers and currently she's working on a project for NABARD in imparting skill in spinning of banana fibers. She's also received the Maharaja Sayaji Rao University of Baroda Recognition Award for being amongst the pioneers of copywriting design studies guided under her. She also has one patent to her credit. She is a member of many professional organizations like Textile Society of America, American Association of Chemists and Colorists, Indian Science Congress, Textile Association of India, etc. She has authored a two volume book titled Traditional Indian Handcrafted Textiles History, Techniques, Processes, and Designs. She has traveled widely and delivered a number of talks, presented a number of papers, and held exhibitions in different forums conferences, museums in India and abroad. She has guided over 10 PhDs and 45 master student dissertation and has over 75 research papers published in international and national research journals. She's been on the board of studies, research committees and advisory boards of a number of universities. So a lot there. Um, so the title of today's talk is Traditional Techniques of Painting and Printing in India. Skills, insight, natural resources, and craft technology developed nearly 5,000 years ago and rendered Indian handcrafted textiles a certain depth, strength, and vigor. The Indian artisan has been famed for being a master dyer, and color played an important part in Indian textiles. Traditionally, natural colors were used on cotton fabrics, and painting and printing of design was done by columns or indigenous brushes and wooden or metal blocks. Traditional methods of ornamentation, such as painting of cotton textiles using columns, are still in production, but the end use has changed. Earlier, these painted textiles were made as temple hangings, pictorial storytelling boards used by bards, and for tent paneling and bed and floor covering. Painted textiles are still seen in the west of India, like Gujarat and Rajasthan, and in the southeast coast of Andhra Pradesh and Tamil Nadu. Block printed textiles are mainly located in the west and northwest of India. So each region and community have their own specific tools, raw materials, and techniques of painting and printing. So before I invite Dr. Karodia, may I please request all of you to put your microphones on mute. We'll be taking the questions at the end of the talk. So please do type in those in the chat box and also type in your name, organization name, and email address. So I now request Dr. Anjali Karol. Thank you, ma'am, for agreeing to the talk. Welcome. Thank you, Padma. Thank you so much. And uh, good evening, everyone. It's uh, an absolute pleasure to be invited by Padma uh, on behalf of INTAC uh, to deliver this talk on traditional techniques of painting and printing in India. I have changed it a little bit. I know earlier it was with resist dyeing also, but uh, I thought it would get a bit too vast. So uh, it's now the traditional techniques of painting and printing in India. Uh, Padma has given a wonderful uh, introduction for me, but uh, before I start, uh, if I could just give a brief about uh, myself and 
my uh, area of study that um, and why I've chosen this particular topic for um, today. Um, I've been in academics like uh, Padma just said that, you know, for the last 38 years almost. And uh, the department where I work is, uh, has always had this thrust in historic textiles of India, especially. And uh, being from the clothing and textile field, uh, we always looked at the textiles from a very, um, and all the techniques from a very technical point of view. And also the researches that were done in uh, the department right from the 1960s was on documentation. And uh, I also started teaching this course way back in the 80s at the undergraduate as well as at our postgraduate uh, level. And one thing that I always found over there, like when we were like how we used to teach it is that you go through all the researches that we had in our department or that time we also had the uh, journal of uh, handloom in uh, which was uh, from the Ministry of Textiles. So we would refer to that and we would be, uh, you know, uh, using it for our teaching. So, uh, but there was no one side kind of a set a book that uh, would give us or for the teachers, but the subject is taught across in various um, institutes, all the design institutes, the clothing textile departments and so on. And so um, I just thought uh, about almost 15, 20 years back that let's uh, put all these things together under a kind of a comprehensive kind of a book, uh, which I finally, um, after I think almost uh, Just one second, I think there is some problem in. Okay, so uh, this is the book that uh, basically uh, came out uh, last year on traditional Indian handcrafted textiles. It's in two volumes. The first one being on the painted, printed and the resist dyeing styles and the second one on the woven, which was published by Nyogi. And uh, here basically what uh, it is, is nothing. It's basically uh, a show Showcasing all our traditional handcrafted textiles from various regions in uh, India. And uh, the main uh, things that go with it are analyzing the techniques of uh, dyeing uh, traditions, printing, painting, uh, weaving, and so on, and understanding how every region is different and how they have their own specifics. Because now, if you uh, go into the uh, uh, textiles that we find now, because of commercialization, because of, um, uh, which is right, because it, they need a market if they have to survive. And there is a mix between, and you've seen that in a number of our earlier, like even uh, what we see in the market, like a person from the West would be using a kind of a motive in the East, the East would be using some kind of motives that have penetrated into the West of the country and so on and so forth, even weaving styles printing styles and so on. So uh, there is a kind of a mix uh, to these. So I, this basically was trying to keep, uh, to understand what uh, the uh, styles were in the regions, uh, specifically from where they came. So uh, this particular talk, uh, like uh, this particular work, could also be useful because uh, I am talking in a platform which is intact, which I thought that could uh, also uh, be useful for people who are on the audience that we have today, who are with uh, museum studies, who are with uh, documentation in uh, various uh, museums of the textile crafts to identify the various textiles, to identify uh, how these particular uh, I mean, whether it's a modern printed, whether it's a resist printed, whether it's a, a pigment. Uh, so these are some of the terms that we would be coming across today. So uh, to start now with uh, my uh, talk for today, um, the term, uh, basically what I've shown you on my first slide, what you're seeing is uh, all the topics that I would be covering today. So we start with a few terminologies. Uh, that have been used in this particular um, uh, work that I'm uh, going to be presenting today. A little history, the kind of shins which I've used for the term for our painted and printed textiles, the regions, 
we talk in detail about the tools that they use the blocks and the different types of blocks that are seen different types of columns or the brushes and the stylus that one sees also uh, the colors we'll be a lot of emphasis on the colors like how you got the different uh, colors oh, okay. and uh, the dyes the mordants the pigments that are uh, there then of course the steps in uh, printing and painting and uh, finally uh, just a brief uh, this thing of uh, an overview about the different uh, textiles that we have in different regions just some of them will be uh, shown in uh, so uh, if we start with our first that is um, are uh, printed and painted like if i have uh, to uh, really distinguish between the two like how would i know that this is a printed textile or this is a painted textile um, the most uh, like if i take any kind of simplest distinction between uh, the two is that in the painted textile uh, the dyes and the mordants they are applied onto the cloth not with a block but by uh, a brush so it's like painting on a canvas here it is a textile and so uh, every hand painted textile you won't find it will have its own uh, individuality and you will not find them being there any kind of repeat patterns throughout the textiles so there'll be uh, even if i'm using along with my painted a block uh, that means a printed uh, portion for outlines it will still be very individualistic and it will not have the same the repeat patterns whereas in the block printed textiles it's more of a stamping obviously and so uh, which could be with a mordant it could be with a resist paste and uh, so through that and then it could be dyed because here what we are going to be talking about today is only a uh, with the natural dyes and pigments we are not getting into the synthetic uh, dyes what are being used uh, these days so the basic differentiation between the two is that here you have the repeats because you're using a block and hence you're repeating it again and again and there you have it more uh, in, so there are no kind of repeat patterns so that's one easy way of identifying any textile whether it is uh, so uh, now if i come to uh, the history just very very brief why i'm putting this history is that uh, even from the earliest sources in our uh, archaeological findings in uh, what they had found were that there was one that it was cotton that was mainly taken straight means it was seen that it was from india in the indus valley civilization and second thing that was very typical that they had certain uh, ornamentation uh, surface ornamentation on these textiles and the two major colors that they found over there was one the indigo that is the blue and one the madder which was the uh, red color that was uh, seen so these were the two main traditionally used colors in india and even today if we see most of our uh, across the places where you have printing and painting we still do find these two uh, colors prominently being used in our textiles whether they are modern uh, printed or they are resist printed we'll come to these terms uh, later so uh, this was the main uh, the thing and even in the, uh, what the, the trade textiles that went across to the west and to the east of and mainly what the fragments that they found were in the west of in egypt and uh, postat even there it was a similar that uh, they had uh, cotton and uh, largely in these two colors red and blue so uh, that is one uh, uh, what we need to this thing that we have had this particular tradition of indigo as well as the madder from centuries that was uh, uh if i could just uh, stick to this uh, we also see in our uh, traditional means uh, in our uh, sculptures in our paintings like in the ajanta paintings and so on the cave paintings there are a lot of uh, this thing about resist dyeing which i'm not covering here uh, which basically is that i either you have the yarn which is tied and then dyed which we call as ikat in our uh, so what you find as patan patola in the west of india in gujarat or you have uh, the bandhas in orissa or the pochampallis 
Talia Rumals and so on, which is the yarn resist. That means you're tying and dyeing the yarn first, then weaving it to get your designs. And what we uh, commonly call those as ikats. And the second one is the fabric tie and dye. And that is what we call as the bandhnis or the leheriyas, which again we find more in the west of, that is Rajasthan and Gujarat. So these two we are not going to be covering in uh, the today's this thing, but they were also textiles that were seen in centuries back. So, uh, and at least to the sixth century, we do find, uh, you know, uh, in the Ajanta painting, the cave paintings, you do see them uh, there. Uh, these are some, what has been colored over here is basically the two regions where we find a lot of painted as well as printed textiles. Printed more in your, uh, of course, there is a lot of painted also in Rajasthan and in uh, Gujarat. Uh, but Rajasthan, Gujarat, um, you know, all this belt of uh, Farukabad, uh, Bag, and so on over here in Madhya Pradesh, you will find a lot of printed textiles in this region. And over here again in your Telangana, Andhra, Orissa, uh, this thing, a lot of painted uh, textiles more and also printed and painted. That means uh, where they're using a block also for print, uh, for in their painted textiles, like you find in Masuni Patnam. So uh, these are just uh, of all the names that go with our printed and painted uh, some, even over here, they are not. So you can imagine the number of different um, types of painted and printed textiles that we have in our country. Uh, these are some of the shins that we could, uh, you know, uh, like four main types that were done in uh, traditionally in our uh, country. Uh, one was mainly for the locals. That is, uh, you know, all your different, like your, even your Azraks or your, uh, Nandana prints or whether it is your Balotra prints, Bagru and so on, uh, they were mainly for the local population. And what we see is that the ones which were for the local indigenous population, they are the ones that have survived the best. And they're still going on because the population or the society, uh, people are still some, of course, they have moved, they've moved the same prints and now you find them in synthetic fabrics, you find them with the uh, screen printing, and so on, but the motives, the, uh, you know, those are still there. You can find the uh, prints similar in uh, these kind of, uh, so one you had for the local market, one you had for the exports. Uh, one very typical example of the exports, apart from uh, the painted textiles of uh, Masuli Patnam and uh, which went from there, was a Sodagiri print that you found in, uh, which was mainly for your uh, export to the uh, Southeast Asia. And the main thing with the export uh, prints were, or painting, uh, painted textiles were, that they would take their designs from the, requ the requirements of the market where they were sending it. So they were not necessarily the designs which you would find typically in the subcontinent here. So they would have a different kind of a design um, repertoire as compared to the ones which were seen in the local, uh, for the local consumption. Then we had some which were done for the temple uh, cloths or the shrines that were, uh, and those were mainly the Matani Pacheri that was for the mother goddess or the Sri Kalahasti over there. We had uh, the painted textiles which were depicting uh, stories from the Ramayan, or you had the Pichwais in Rajasthan which you know were kept uh, behind the Vishnu uh, temples basically depicting what was the occasion. Uh, you had all kinds of, uh, so mainly for, uh, to do with uh, the temple uh, traditions. And then of course they were for the royal courts, which were on a finer kind of material. The prints that you found were on that was more intricate, more uh, uh, perfectly uh, done. But another, uh, uh, type of uh, court fabric was also to do with the uh, tents and the upholsteries, the curtain materials, you know, for the royal households and also for their uh, canopies and things when they would 
be traveling. So when the tents and all were being put up, they would have these printed uh, or the uh, bedspreads or even the floor coverings would be uh, printed. So these were the four or five main printed and painted textiles that um, the types that were done uh, traditionally in our uh, now, of course, all these are uh, used in, uh, for other end users and we find them uh, coming in uh, for dress materials, saris, uh, ordnies and all, of course, yardages that are being uh, made, uh, even your linen and stuff like that. So, um, and of course, the traditional, sometimes they're not using the traditional techniques that uh, uh, now we come to um, the type of tools that are uh, basically used. Uh, the main tool in uh, printing, of course, is your block. Block plays the most important uh, uh, tool that is there for uh, printing. And uh, even in the blocks, you have a number of different types of blocks that were used. Depending upon, again, the end result of your uh, means what is it that you what kind of a design did you want and what kind of a resist were you using what kind of a paste were you using and uh, the viscosity of the paste and all that played a part in what type of a material you would use for your blocks uh, the most common ones are of course the wooden blocks that uh, you would uh, see over here the first one that uh, i'm listening where you have the outline and the filling. We'll talk about the outline, like if I have an outline, then I call it as a rate block. If I have the filling inside in the west of India and north of India, they would call it as the datta or the uh, filling block. And if it's a background, they would call it as the gut block. So uh, now this blocks also would vary. Then this is an interesting, uh, this is basically for your khadi printing which the brass kind of a mold. Uh, what you see is like, if I see the smaller one over here, the round one, this is a brass mold. And behind that, they fill in the curry or the adhesive that is used for your rogan that we use for the tinsel printing or the curry printing is filled inside this uh, mold. It's something like, you know, uh, what you use for your chaklis and uh, sevanya and all the molds that you uh, have. So you fill it up in that. And then with this piston or with this uh, uh, kind of a, a plunger inside, you uh, take out the required amount and you uh, print it onto your uh, uh, fabric. And through that, after that, the either the gold or the silver powder is sprinkled on it to get your curry. Uh, then we had the nail blocks. This was mainly used uh, where it, you wanted the print or just dots that were seen. And there's this mud printing that is uh, quite common, uh, was quite common now, of course, it's not uh, done anymore, but uh, it was uh, next to Baroda, where they would have these uh, textiles with just the dotted design. It means it would look like a bandhani, but it was an, in black and red. So, uh, you know, the resist paste, which was made with mud, was printed with these block, uh, the nail blocks. Then, of course, the cast metal blocks were there. But this was found a lot in the finer prints, where you wanted very fine outlines, uh, finer designs, smaller designs. Seen a lot in the north, um, means in Uttar Pradesh and uh, that uh, part. And these blocks were the metal. Of course, they lasted much longer and you've got very fine kind of uh, prints from it. Uh, these blocks are mainly for your wax. The way the wax resists, that means your batik, that is. Uh, and uh, these would also be seen in uh, the Southeast uh, Asia, where you have uh, these kind of uh, blocks, even in the metal blocks. But they were uh, a little different as compared to the metal. Over here, if you see that it has uh, uh, the designs are uh, very different and they're engraved inside. Here they have the, in, there's no uh, background to it because the wax otherwise would stick to the back of the uh, uh, metal. And here this is a, a combination of your wood and your uh, metal. 
So these little dots that you're seeing inside, the finer ones, these are with metal and uh, the rest of it is in wood. So uh, this is used uh, in the Azraq um, for printing of the finer, uh, this thing. So this is another one that is, um, which we find in, uh, so these are the, uh, basically for the blocks that are uh, seen. And these are the different types. And they, I'm sure there may be some more that uh, could go with it, but the main ones would be these in, uh, the brass molds, the nail blocks, the metal, the wooden ones, of course, which are the most common, and also the uh, combination of the wood and the metal. Uh, this is uh, what is um, the different, you know, to get one design in uh, blocks, like um, the center one that you see over here, this is what we call as a rake, and in the south, they call it as the masa block which is the outline block. So usually the outline block will only be one. Then you would have the filling blocks. That means the color that would go inside this flower. So the outline of the flower would be with the center block and the ones which you're filling in would be from, the, uh, from this particular block here. Now this could be in a number of data blocks could be there because I might want the flower petals to be in uh, red, I might want the, uh, the things to be in, um, the leaves to be in green. So depending upon the number of colors that I'm using, I would be having those many of my uh, data blocks. And this particular block is, will be for the background. So the background of it, and if you notice that these two blocks will be the opposite. Here, the design that I want will be engraved. I mean, it will be protruding out. And there it will be in the opposite. So the background gets colored with this. And that's what we call as the gar of the. So basically, your whole design that is there will be done through these blocks. And depending upon the kind of or the number of colors and the intricacies of your, the blocks would change for that. So every place that uh, would be, uh, they would have, depending upon their designs, they would be making the blocks in that place. Some places you'll find the blocks being bigger. Usually the block size will be between four to six inches and or in some places it would be bigger. So again, that variation you will find in different and that variation is because of the kind of designs and the kind of treatments that they're doing for getting that particular, the number of colors, the number of this other uh, outlines, the intricacy and so on. Uh, these are some of the columns that they use in uh, now here in uh, Sri Kalahasti, basically, and in Masuli Patnam. Masuli Patnam will be a combination of a block as well as your uh, columns. So these are basically for the resist that they use in uh, the south over there is mainly to do with your wax. And these are some of the brushes that are uh, seen. And this, of course, is a, a real, this is a diagrammatic uh, diagram for it. And this is what you have of your uh, actual column. That uh, Now, this one that you find over here is mainly for your outline. Uh, means, you know, for drawing and sketching. So this is like your pencil or your pen that you are uh, drawing with. And these would be mainly where, or even for your filling up of certain models, they would use this. And this would be mainly for your wax and for your uh, uh, even modern filling and so on, but mainly for a wax uh, resist that they would. And these are the brushes which are made by from the end of twigs and which are used for brush uh, filling up of the colors in um, for wherever the moderns are required. Or even here, they even have the indigo dye, uh, indigo color that is your blue color directly filled up into your. Uh, so uh, this could be used for those. Uh, uh, then of course we come to, before we uh, take off with the whole process, just to understand that uh, the raw material as far as your pigments and dyes go, the main, like I told you, the traditional, uh, this thing was mainly to do with your indigo and your madder. Uh, these were the two dyes that were used. And along with that, not with indigo, but with madder, you had various mordants that went with it. And in indigo, it was mainly to do with over dyeing that uh, they used to get 
either your greens or your yellows and so on. So uh, this particular, uh, this thing basically indigo has a um, kind of a, what do you call it, um, uh, affinity for any kind of fibers, like whether it is a cotton or a silk. So it's easy to get onto your uh, uh, fabric, but it's a vat. So one has to understand that basically it has to develop, it means the color has to develop or it has to get oxidized. So that is why the it's dipped in the indigo vat and then which is basically the reduced form of it. And then it goes on uh, to get oxidized by air outside. So uh, that is one. Um, so in this particular type, when you're using uh, indigo, the most common way of getting your designs over here is by resisting. That means the uh, this particular, like if I see this uh, design that I have here, this white portion has been resisted with some kind of a resist material. And then it is put into this vat to get the color. And then it is dried out in the sun to get the blue. So uh, this is uh, basically most indigo prints that you will find will be with using the resist technique for uh, getting the uh, designs. That is, uh, so the resist is basically used to get the design for, uh, so uh, of course nowadays uh, you don't have the, uh, they use the cake or the uh, powder also. So it's an extract that is, um, which is easier to use basically. So uh, that is indigo. Uh, then we had the red color, which was, uh, I think everybody's heard of the madder, the manjit or the manjishta and uh, chai roots and the all in uh, so any material or any plant source that has alizarine in it can give you this particular red color so uh, this becomes the dye and why i've put this over here so if you see this particular print here uh, the black outlines have been mordanted with ferrous and the red wherever you're seeing the red that has been done with your uh, alum and then it has been put into the madder or into the manjeet or the uh, all solution. And this then, wherever you have put the mordant, you will get your color. So, and this portion which you see in off-white or the cream or the background color does not take up any kind of color because there is no mordant over there. So madder basically requires a mordant to give you a color. So modern dyeing is what we call here. And in that means you're getting a color, you're adding a color depending upon which modern you're using. And in our indigo, we call it as the resist if I'm wanting to get the uh, designs or the color. Turmeric and pomegranate of course, uh, are also used as um, for yellow and green. And over dyeing uh, with your indigo, you will get that and black, Ferrous metallic salt is what you use for your black color. So these could be some of the others. And these are the typical colors that you will find in. Uh, now the maroon can be changed. We'll come to that. It can be uh, changed according to uh, by adding a little bit of ferrous to it. So uh, this is just to make it exactly what I've just explained. And I've just spoken of is that uh, you could do this modenting by either printing or by painting. That means either with a block or with a color and or with a brush. And uh, this is how you would first get, this is where the alum has been. And once I put it into the matter, this lines that you see here get converted to the red one. Same way over here, we have a similar kind with the iron. So basically uh, this is the way it is, um, uh, Colored. So uh, in this whole, um, okay, let's just finish with the natural pigments first. Uh, another way of getting what we call as a direct way of uh, printing is, uh, or painting, is with your pigments. Pigments are basically uh, any kind of insoluble. Yeah. Uh, okay. Am I clear? Am I uh, audible to everyone? Yeah. Please carry on, it's clear. So, uh, 
basically these are from natural sources it could be from any metallic uh, oxides it could be from your minerals that you have it could be from uh, insects it could come from certain plants marine species any of these uh, you could get these uh, colors and basically what they do here is that you have to be making a kind of a rogan or a localized adhesive on in which these colors are mixed and then they are painted onto your it's like what we have nowadays in the market like your acrylic uh, paints so you can directly uh, use that and here if you see in the lower one this is the rogan printing which they do with a stylus it's a metal rod and with that they get these kind of and this one is a fur which is done with a normal brush and a color over here so these are printed directly and we call these as pigments so you have the direct method of getting it you have the modulated method of getting it you have the resist technique of getting it that means you could be resisting a particular area with any kind of a resist material which could be uh, from musk it could be from um, any different uh, um, sources and uh, but something that is going to resist uh, that particular area or you could have what we looked at in the khadi that is a resin or an uh, adhesive technique in which you uh, either can mix if i want a colored khadi or else i could uh, put my gold and silver powder on it which gives me the gold and silver khadi so these are the four main methods by which i can get my printed or painted textiles for surface ornamentation on my cotton woven fabric so uh, these are the main so when i look at any textile um, looking at the way uh, the colors that are there the kind of uh, uh, you know um, uh, also looking at the back of the color like if i have the resin or the adhesive one or even if i have the pigment the direct one through pigment uh, i i won't be able to see that on the reverse side so even by looking at it from the reverse side one will be able to see whether it has been uh, resisted or whether it has been uh, directly printed or painted or uh, whether it is a, a resin or an adhesive uh, so you will be able to like if you understand the techniques you would be able to uh, now in the direct like i told you initially that you could even do your indigo direct by uh, like that's what they are doing in uh, shri kalas you know directly painting with indigo so uh, that because they're not using the traditional uh, the plant source it's already processed the indigo uh, this thing and then they are uh, using it okay so uh, these are the techniques of the process that you have direct modulant resist and of course your thick uh, or the adhesive technique or the thick resin that is the rogan that uh, you can uh, uh and when it comes to the simple steps that you have in uh, again over here there's a lot of similarity that you will find in uh, your uh, steps or the uh, way the uh, printing and the painting is done uh, the number of steps that you will find in your drying washing resisting and uh, dyeing that may change again depending upon the number of colors and the kind of uh, design that you want so some of them are more intricate like if i go to azrak they would have about 14 steps that go into it uh, before they can actually get the color or minimum at least 10 they would require to get the design uh, if i uh, even now uh, in your masuli patna more in your depending upon how many colors there are and more the number of colors the more the number of uh, resisting and modulating i would have to uh, increase the number of steps but uh, generally if i look at uh, means all these uh, techniques that we find in india they have a certain similarity again mainly because of again as i uh, mentioned earlier the raw material that we are using is cotton the uh, dyes are mainly to do with our natural dyes and over here mainly having your indigo and uh, madder and some combinations in that so uh, Uh, means the moderns would change in uh, some of them, or there is over dyeing of uh, different uh, materials on it. So uh, that may vary.
but the basic um, steps that we follow are the first one always because if it is cotton you have to the first thing in your dyeing printing that one needs to do is to scour it or and bleach it that means remove all the kind of um, impurities waxes oils anything that has uh, come into it because you need it to be more absorbent and uh, you need uh, so the and the color needs to be white as white as possible before we can start the further treatments the second step is your uh, pre treatment that is given to cotton and mainly what we call it as uh, the harda treatment or the myrobilan and that is your pre modeling uh, again over here you have uh, you know uh, different uh, ingredients that go into it but uh, again the ingredients are very region specific but similar uh, they might like if i'm using dung then uh, like in the in rajasthan or in some uh, desert areas they would have camel so they would use the camel dung if i have more of goat and sheep i would use that dung or if i have buffaloes i would use that as the or even the, the kind of oils that i use or the kind of resist materials that i use depending upon what is the available source in that place is how i would be changing but the general like i need an a uh, kind of a gummy solution that would be i need something that's going to bleach i need something that's going to be an alkali those are the common uh, things that go into it then i have the printing and painting with either modens or printing and painting with the resist paste then i have in some cases washing before i put it in for into the dye bath or after that then i have the dyeing which we'll do in uh, so depending upon basically the designing the color these methods there may be some kind of a variation across in all parts of our country so the first part that is of course to do with our scarring and bleaching and this is mainly to make it more uh, absorbent and uh, so you will see that uh, here what they use is basically your emulsified solution of all your uh, uh caustic soda which is uh, one of the most uh, so it's basically an alkali and a an oil which is what soap is all about when you emulsify that and they use so these are the local things that they are using and of course there is dung which is basically acts as a bleaching uh, the thing to it it's soaked it's washed it's beaten thoroughly and then it's left out in the sun to dry which also acts as a bleaching agent for it so this sometimes depending upon how thick the material is now of course they get it bleached uh, from the market so the raw material that they are using so now these steps have definitely changed across in all parts of our country then you have the myrobilan now myrobilan treatment is basically done to the treated uh, uh, the bleached uh, fabric and uh, in uh, you know they call it by different names across like uh, peela karna and uh, in south they will have another name for it and so on but basically what they do here is that you have your myrobilan um, which is put into your um, uh, means this fabric is soaked into it for a little while and then uh, without washing the excess is removed it's beaten so that there's no uh, extra uh, uh, what do you call it residue that is left on the fabric and then it is set to dry a uh, color application again you would uh, like what uh, i just told you that when i'm using my brushes or my columns or my blocks i could be modenting it i could be resisting it or i could even be doing a combination of both of them even that could be done in uh, so some parts i resist some parts i modent before i put it into so uh, when i am uh, like trying to combine like one of the most common examples that you will find in where indigo as well as madder is used together is in the azra uh, textile and you will find that over there you have both the red the blue the black and the white so uh, depending upon that you would uh, have uh, you know different uh, methods by which you would uh, so uh, but most of them basically they will follow the same uh, process so what we do is first is the modern printing and that is done with alum alum is uh, 
a very simple what we call as fatkari in uh, India and uh, basically a sulfate and uh, so this is uh, uh, done for your red color mainly so now if I want a little more maroon in it uh, the second thing that I do is also with um, I uh, could add a little bit of ferrous which is for my black if I uh, so it will depend upon what shades I can do shading with it depending upon how much and uh, how I use my uh, uh, model for this so uh, and here when I'm doing the printing like if I'm doing the printing with uh, I would require some amount of thickener so in some places they use the gum Arabic in some they use the tamarin seed powder so uh, these are the main two that are uh, used in it and here what they do is that if I have printed it and I've used some kind of an adhesive and uh, before I put it into my uh, dye bath of matter I usually let it dry first properly then I wash it but uh, before because this adhesive could come in the way of giving me a good color so you know it could be a muddy kind of a brown if the adhesive is not removed properly but another way uh, this is when I'm doing the printing on it but if I'm doing I want the background to be red then I'm just going to do a kind of a potai means I'm just going to spread it with a brush which is without the thickener really in it or even when I'm using it I use a small amount of thickener then this washing step could be deleted this is now uh, done for the iron that is for my black color and here what they basically do is that iron rusted pieces this could be you know even your um, um, shoes from uh, the horses uh, this thing or any kind of metal material which is rusted that is put into jaggery a certain amount of flour water and it's allowed to ferment and then after that they add in again your gum arabic or your tamarind seed flour make a paste out of it and then again it is printed in the places where I want my black and then of course I usually uh, I would take it in for washing uh, for modernity so uh, this is what I've already mentioned to you that uh, it's dried out thoroughly and if there is a certain amount of uh, means you feel that there is more of the paste of um, the adhesive it needs to be washed before it can go in for uh, dyeing now the dyeing will be done in matter okay so you can get all kinds of scales of red right from a pale pink to light to orangey to dark maroon and so on depending upon my mordant this is what they call as a rangchul or uh, basically it is uh, you know they make a kind of a pit they uh, have the uh, red color in it uh, the matter in it and uh, they also add this uh, dhaurika food which is a tamarisk uh, flour and that is basically so that it doesn't get smudged in uh, so it has different names in different parts this particular like um, it's not just madder that is used across you have uh, al you have uh, arch you have surangi um, different chai root that is used in the south uh, of india and Manjit and or Manjish, that is the Indian matter is more in the north of India that you will find. And then we come uh, to the um, other one, which is your resist, or even uh, I think everybody is very familiar with the word Dabu printing. So Dabu printing is nothing but your resist printing. And uh, this could be done not just with indigo, it could even be done with your reds or with any, uh, but wherever you are resisting the design and then dyeing it into and as I've already mentioned in indigo, that is usually the more common way of uh, getting your patterns. Again, here you can do it with a, uh, the resisting can be done with your uh, uh, columns. It could be done with your blocks. It could be done with any, uh, and you have your resist paste then. So this is the way, um, one thing that's interesting that uh, you could uh, see the change this is how uh, you know this little tub that he has over here that had the resist paste in it and uh, this particular now the same paste of uh, Dabu is now put into these kind of taris or trays and uh, on this resist paste 
they usually sprinkle a little uh, sawdust. It's mainly to absorb up any kind of moisture or anything that is there. Or earlier, they would use the dried powder dung from uh, the goat uh, dung. And uh, after it is, these are the kind of blocks that they used for the resist uh, printing. Uh, so this is also called as Dabu. Now, the interesting part is that here, again, there'll be different types of resist or Dabus. Now, depending upon whether my resist has to undergo one treatment, two treatments, or does it have to be strong? <clears throat> so basically, the type of uh, 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 recipes that they follow will uh, just make like the first one that you have, which is the first one which is done with just limestone, black clay soil. That means the mud resist. That can only take one kind of uh, treatment in your dye solution. Another one, which is more, uh, it's got lime and gum, which is mixed with it and kept overnight for resisting. That you can uh, also, like a little more than one. And the strongest of the lot is what they call uh, with the guar beans. So uh, that one can take a number of uh, resist, uh, means it can undergo a number of uh, dyeing and washing before it can be uh, taken off. So if I want some parts to be in white and I know I'm going to take it down through three different, uh, uh, what do you call them, uh, treatments, then I would go by the stronger um, treatment or the double paste. Uh, then of course it goes in for uh, indigo dyeing or, or it could even go for any other, but uh, we are talking in terms of one we did with the matter and one over here and then it is dried out uh, thoroughly after, and after the indigo, first it is dried in the sun for the color to develop, and then it is taken for a wash where they will remove the resist also. The resist paste is also removed. But the color needs to develop first. Uh, that is a bit uh, all the, diff the basic uh, techniques that are used. Now, if I have, depending upon how many colors, what uh, uh, type of design, I would have different types of uh, means the treatments. The interesting part over here is that, um, you know, in a direct print, I know that this is the color that will go here and this is what it will look like by directly putting it here. Uh, whereas in these prints, you have to go backwards. You have to imagine what you are going to be. So if I, um, like, I need to get one, uh, like if I have a motive and I see a color, this thing, I have to actually think back and make a complete, uh, this thing as to how I'll go about doing my printing. And that is something that our artisans are extremely good with. And even just looking at a print, they can immediately tell you. For us, it would take a whole lot of time and understand it and so on. But uh, for them, it, uh, it's like uh, they know their recipes perfectly. Uh, now I'm just going to be taking you through some of the different um, uh, prints that we have and painted textiles that we have. Uh, this is the Azraq, which I think has become extremely popular and you'll find it across now and everybody's... Uh, so here basically the why it is uh, so well, uh, this thing is that there are two basic uh, USBs of this particular um, textile. One is that it is uh, resist as well as mordant. They're using both the techniques over here. And secondly, the designs that they have, they are uh, in a geometric or in a, uh, like with a little bit of floral uh, thing, but they're mirror images because they have a design which is uh, printed on both sides also. So the traditional designs that they had, they were all mirror images of each other. So uh, that is one, uh, this thing that, um, and you will find them in a brilliant blue, brilliant um, red, and with uh, white, very strong white. Uh, if you remember, initially I've shown you one block which had those dotted uh, with metal dots, and you can see those little dots over here, which would be the resist block for the, so uh, that is, uh, uh, like that would be what is giving you the resist to, uh, before it goes in for all the other colors. This was a nail block that uh, I'd shown initially. And uh, this now, of course, unfortunately, it is not seen in uh, 
I mean, there's totally, um, I mean, there is no production of this particular textile now in this region of Padra and uh, Baroda. Uh, but uh, these were the nail blocks and this was only in your uh, red and your black and worn by one community here in uh, the Rabaris, they would wear these Ognis and also their Ghagras. This was a textile that was for export, which I'd shown you initially also. And uh, these would be totally, they had a very strong grid pattern and a very fine grid pattern that would be seen over here. And uh, this was mainly for the export, depending upon, they would give the designs over there, which were, um, Robin, this is what they do with the stylus, uh, again seen in, the, in Kutch. And uh, this actually looks like an embroidery and mainly done on their ghagras, bedspreads. Now, of course, they're making more of these kind of wall hangings that you're seeing at the back over here. But this was not how the traditional, it was a very uh, open and a very um, simple kind of designs that they would use earlier. And uh, it was like a replacement for the embroidered ghagras. So these would give uh, the tribal communities there, it was a, a kind of a substitute for, uh, this is a khadi uh, printing, which is uh, done on silver over here. And uh, this is done with those different, uh, uh, the blocks, uh, not the blocks, but the molds rather of uh, uh, printing, which uh, I'd shown earlier, but uh, these were very uh, popular, especially, again, this gave that raised kind of uh, effect and uh, used a lot on, um, especially for the royal uh, cost, um, textiles, for their uh, upholsteries, uh, cushion covers, um, you know, any kind of spreads and so on. Uh, Bark is from Madhya Pradesh and here one very typical feature of this is that you have on a green background, they would have the maroon and the black. So this is one uh, typical thing with the, um, the bark prints. Now, of course, they have it in, but, and also the uh, umbi motive or the mango motive was typical to their uh, balotra, a very local kind of uh, this thing. But here again, their colors and their, uh, they have a lot of over dyeing, like in uh, green, in uh, yellow also they have used and but it's mainly in stripes simple patterns not as fine as what you find in azra but uh, much simpler form of that and uh, but again a lot of modern thing as well as resisting over here bagru from your rajasthan here uh, again on a cream background you would have your uh, borders which were mainly um, geometric and very simple motives I means their motives were never like the sangha near ones which you know are more uh, realistic more naturalistic but there but in bagru also another very typical to them is the ghoul motive the ghoul is the central you must have seen it in a lot of bedspreads and even you know those wrap around skirts and things that we used to get you had that round uh, motive with uh, uh, elephants and things like that drawn across so that is typical from that uh, region Sanghanet was always a little more um, uh, refined in their, uh, because they were mainly dealing with the royal uh, textiles also. And uh, so their motives were also more uh, naturalistic, more uh, finer, and even the range of colors that they used over here were much uh, more. Uh, this is the Shri Kala Hasti Kalamkari, which is basically done only with your painted these were mainly as temple hangings. Here you had a number of colors. Here, of course, this particular sample has just got three colors. Main difference between your Kalamkari of Shri Kalahasti and the Masuli Patnam. Um, Shri Kalahasti was mainly from your uh, scriptures of Ramayana and Mahabharata. They would have different uh, people. They would have uh, different gods and goddesses shown in different colors. They had color coding done for them. And the backgrounds were always dark, maroon, black. Whereas in uh, Kalankari of uh, Masuli Patnam, these had more of the Persian influence. And here the background, you would find it more in the cream color. That was, uh, so that was another this thing. And here they also use blocks for the outlines for, uh, 
So there was some little bit of uh, repetition that you could uh, find in there. Uh, Matani Pacheri is from Ahmedabad. This is another uh, thing only in your black. Now, of course, they're using indigo. A lot of indigo is being used, but traditionally only in your black, uh, cream and uh, red. The background was always in red that they uh, had. And this was mainly for a tribal community, which uh, had this, uh, uh, you know, as their, um, uh, like they would make their own temples because they were not allowed into the temples of uh, the other temples. So they would make their own temples using the mother, mother goddess as their main, uh, that's why Mata Nipacheri means Mata uh, as the mother goddess. Fud is another type, like the others were mainly for your uh, floral, I mean for your temples and uh, this is another painted textile, but this was with pigment. That's why I put it over here. So you had a pigment like your pichwais and things that they were also uh, with pigment. And this, this the main, uh, they were mainly stores. They were for storytelling, uh, bars going from one place to the other. They used uh, pigments from your minerals mainly over here. And uh, the stories were mainly of Bapuji and Dev Narayan, who were the heroes of Rajasthan from Hilwada side. So uh, that is um, the pigment from uh, Fad. That's it. Thank you. And uh, I have to acknowledge uh, one of my uh, staff, uh, Dure Sevar, who helped me a lot in putting uh, this slides together. And uh, thank you once again, Padma, for having me. And uh, now back to the audience, I suppose. Thank you so much. I think it was a very interesting talk and very well illustrated. I'm sure everybody enjoyed. I'm hoping there will be a lot of questions too. So any questions? Uh, we do have one. Can we start with that? Um, it said, uh, may I request to kindly elaborate on how one can differentiate between direct, modern, resist, and adhesive printed textile when looking at the reverse side. How does one differentiate? Okay. Um, see here, uh, simply put, if I have an adhesive, uh, I'm not going to get the print on the wrong side at all. In my painted textiles, where I'm using, um, see the thickener that I'm using for the modern, that I'm uh, applying, like supposing I'm using alum on uh, with printing and the thickener that I'm using, now supposing it does penetrate on the wrong side of my uh, fabric, then I will, the wrong side would also pick up that red color. But if the thickener is, uh, means that the viscosity is more and it's going to let it only remain on the right side, then I'm not going to be able to see that uh, print on the other side. So in indigo, what we find is that in indigo, you will have it on both sides, the indigo color. And even the printing, if uh, basically when I'm doing any kind of printing and I'm using the right viscosity, it will come down on the other side. So uh, the resist part I'm talking about in my indigo printing. But if I have it on uh, for the modern thing, if the modern gets remained on the top of, it will also depend upon the thickness of my fabric. So it's not just to do with only the viscosity, it will also depend upon the fabric that is, uh, and pigment printing will always be only on one side. It will not show on the uh, reverse side. So I hope I have, uh, I don't know who uh, asked this, but I hope I've been able to uh, Is answer. Yeah, you can unmute yourself. Is it clear? The question, the answer. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much for uh, you know uh, taking it so nicely and describing it very well. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Ashima. Now the next question is: um, Please uh, give the exact definition of chintz. Most courses give different definitions, so if you could please tell me that is very very true. Uh, that's really true. Uh, there are a number of definitions that have been given to shins. Uh, one of the definitions that I have uh, seen is a glazed fabric, which is, uh, you know, it was very popular during uh, the, what, well, the early 1900s and uh, 
for export that went into and also for our local uh, this thing for quilts and for uh, uh, reside covers and you know those kind of uh, textiles that was also the term that i've used over here shins is cotton for shins is one thing that it is uh, related to cotton and uh, second that it is a textile that is ornamented so uh, the terminology and why I've called it as shins over here is mainly because of this. But you're right, there are a number of uh, variations in this particular uh, word, shins. And also in some, they give it as that only the glazed uh, materials are uh, the cotton, which was glazed or uh, finished in that particular way. That is what was the shins and the direct printing means not uh, using uh, uh, any of these other methods. Thank you. Any other questions? Because I don't see any in the chat box. Are there any other questions? I think the presentation was very clear. We have very few questions. Okay, uh, we have a question from Anjali Jain. Uh, what are some of the resist materials used? Can the same resist material be used for different dyes? So is it different resist material for different dyes or is it, it was a common resist material for all dyes? Um, different dyes, uh, when uh, we talk about, maybe I won't be able to, uh, I know that when it comes to the synthetic dyes, we definitely do have different resist materials or different um, raisins that we use for different, uh, but uh, in, as far as uh, what is typically used across is gum uh, arabica or what they make as the rogan, which is uh, to do with uh, your castor oil, which is, uh, you know, it is heated and then uh, it is made into uh, this particular kind of uh, addison. So uh, for your madder uh, or for indigo, uh, definitely your gum arabic is uh, one of the most common uh, dyes that are, uh, sorry, uh, most common uh, resist materials that are. And of course, there is also, along with that, they use the um, clay, which is also got or some kind of a, um, like guar beans, you know, which again, get, uh, the natural gums that, uh, or uh, stiffeners that come along with it. So uh, that could be uh, used to... Uh, so uh, natural dyes, as far as madder, indigo, these go, definitely these are some of the common ones which you'll find across in uh, used by all our artisans. And, uh, but with the others, one would have to uh, see according to what their uh, abilities. So, uh, so any other questions? Okay, the next question is, um, any rough estimate of what percentage of organic cotton textiles are used by craftspeople today? Uh, I think the organic textiles are catching on now. And uh, there are a few belts where I know that there are a few in Gujarat, Kutch uh, area where they're starting with the Kala cotton, which was a local kind of a cotton. Uh, they have a lot of organic cotton being grown even in the South. A lot of people, uh, one of our own students who's working uh, near a village over here where they've started growing organic cotton. So it is catching on, but uh, how much of it exactly is uh, being used? Like if you want some numbers, I'm sorry, I wouldn't be able to give you those uh, details, but uh, definitely you get to hear a lot about organic cotton now. So basically without your pesticides and without your, uh, so. Uh, Thank you. Any other question? Would anybody like to add something or ask? I don't see any in the chat box. So no, I think thank you so very much. Um, it was a very interesting talk. I think everybody's saying very informative. You can see in the chat boxes the kind of comments. Um, so I think thank you everyone for joining. Thank you very much, Dr. Anjali Karolia. It was a very, very interesting talk. Very detailed. One got to see very, I mean, the tools, the techniques, everything was so visually very, very clear. So thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs>
So, very uh, different platform for me, but uh, I enjoyed it. Thank you so much. And you did wonderful. You did one. The presentation was very nice. And thank you everyone for joining us. I would also like to thank uh, my team for the registration and uploading. Sushant, Mary Nesh, Faria, thank you very much. Thank you everyone for helping me. Um, thank you then. Bye. See you. Bye.